Good morning. My name is John Eckert, and it is my privilege to serve as your worship associate for the month of October. Many of you know me as a longtime member, a commercial real estate attorney, father of two young boys, and a mountain biker. Sorry in advance to those of you who prefer quiet hikes. <laughs> Most of you are not aware of the journey that brought me here. My journey started in a very conservative Midwest town as a Catholic altar boy in a naturally green countryside full of natural beauty and abundant wildlife, especially deer and turkey. It led me to a conservative college and a circle of conservative friends and to a YMCA camp that emphasized the sea in Young Men's Christian Association. Ready to escape from my small town, I joined the Marine Corps after college and traveled to Southern California to serve as an adjutant slash human resources officer in an infantry battalion. It was here in California my eyes began to open. I learned that their environment is fragile and easily spoiled, and that humans are exploiting and harming the environment without concern for long-term consequences. And I finally understood the need for government regulation, despite my under, undergraduate training to the contrary. After the Marine Corps, I worked for a large corporation and studied the law at night. While studying corporations law and pondering questions such as whose interests are company officers and directors required to serve, and can a company make a decision that doesn't maximize investors' returns, I got laid off and witnessed firsthand the corporation's true nature. <laughs> I learned that being, a, being good at a job and being liked by my peers and superiors didn't guarantee a stable long-term career. The corporation really didn't care. Unfortunately, corporations don't think they're allowed to care. Around that time, I attended a UU service, learned its core principles, and quickly accepted it as my new truth. Unitarianism didn't rely upon familiar 2,000-year-old stories and tried to apply them to my life. It instead addressed real, current, and important issues directly. Rather than asking, what would Jesus do, or in the case of my law school discussions, what would our founding fathers think, it asked, what would a caring person do and think? someone who cares about people, the environment, and the future of this planet? I've come to find those much better questions, ones that I'll be delighted to explore with you this month as we discuss emotional intelligence here at Tapestry. We are a liberal, progressive congregation open to those who share our values of free thought and lifelong learning. We welcome you without regard to race, creed, age, economic status, physical ability, gender expression, or sexual orientation. These are some of the categories that have divided rather than united people of faith. We do not require that you believe the same as we. Indeed, here you'll find many different paths. Welcome to Tapestry, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. We have some exciting events coming up at Tapestry, including today's Fall Feast Potluck Brunch, which you can see setting up in the back. I hope. Many of you are going to be able to join. Uh, we also have other events through the course of the month uh, that you can see in our order service, the newsletter, and the website, and in the Tapestry mobile app. At this time, I'd like to invite Kathy Spawn up to speak with you about the Ways and Means Committee and what they do for Tapestry. Good morning. I'm Kathy Spawn, and I'm a member of the Ways and Means Committee. Our job is to raise funds for this congregation. Each year we have a challenge to raise around 30,000. This year it's 28,000 that we need to raise. That goes into the general fund. That's, uh, that seems very um, daunting, but we do it. We do it every year. We sponsor several events throughout the year. We just had the Welcome Back kickoff, uh, which was a good success, a great success, and lots of fun. We have two auctions a year. One is coming up on the 15th of this month, and I hope all of you can join us. These raise the greatest amount of our challenge. Marsha Medina takes um, all of the uh, service auction uh, items. Um, she is still looking for service items for this event. If you are new and wonder, what is a service auction? When I first started with you, you might go, what is service auctions? It can be anything that you can give of yourself. 
It can host dinner, wash cars, pet sitting, sponsor trips to museums and places of interest. The list is endless. Ask anyone ways means we can help you come up with something. Uh, it not only helps us, it is a great way to get to know people in a small group. Our committee has a small core of um, members, but we welcome all new members. One of the things we do encourage is that you help us maybe once a year. You don't have to join the committee. You just sign up with uh, usually Sue Deering or myself or Marsha and there's Sue. Um, and you know we'll give you something to do, whether it's uh, you know helping clean up, set up, uh, serve food. And we have fun doing these things. We really do. Sue so might not agree, but we do. <laughs> it is work, but we have fun. If you have new ideas for fundraising, please see us. We'd love to learn some new things. We try to be inclusive and uh, have, you know, so everyone can have a chance to have fun at things. Um, also, by coming to the events you are helping, and I hope having fun and getting to know each other, check out our calendar on the web or you know any of the other places that you can see it. We have lots of events coming up. We have UU Got Talent, which this congregation has lots of talent. It's really fun. We uh, usually in the I guess it's in the beginning of uh, winter we will have um, a concert at uh, Dana and Bill's house, and that's a wonderful event. It's uh, part of um, one of the things that we do when you have a great dinner. So that's Ways and Means, basically. And I want to thank everyone that's ever helped on Ways and Means, especially Sue Deering. I mean, she does a lot for us. And Marsha and uh, everyone else. I have a great group that works with us. And anyone that's ever um, contributed in some way, I want to thank you because you're part of this congregation and you keep it going. Thank you. On another note, in a different hat, I am the Congregational Nurse for Tapestry, and I am giving flu shots today, back there. We are sponsored by Hogue Hospital. They are free for anyone ages 9 and over. Come see me. The flu season has started. Thank you. At this time, we'd like to invite Lynn Cowan up to speak about uh, what is happening with getting us into a new home. Good morning. For those of you who may not know me, I am Lynn Cowan, and I am president of the Tapestry Board of Trustees. And I want to start off by thanking all of you who have given so generously to the Raise the Roof campaign for the down payment on a building of our own. Today, we have over $300,000 cash in the bank that you have donated just this summer. When I'm When I mention this to people outside of Tapestry, everyone is just amazed that you dug so deep and so quickly. It's a testament to our commitment to being an anchor for Unitarian Universalism in South Orange County. Adding to that, the $200,000 from the last campaign we raised a couple of years ago, plus $150,000 from our growth accounts, and the more than $60,000 that you'll be contributing over the next two years for fix-up expenses, well, you'd think buying a building would be easy, right? Well, over the last several months, we've learned a lot about financing a church building and the many trade-offs needed when purchasing an older building, which is what we can basically afford. Many of you have toured the buildings in the Bircher Complex in Lake Forest, and we recently learned of a warehouse property in Laguna Hills that could work for us. There are pros and cons for all of them. But I'm here today to tell you that on September 29th, the Tapestry Board of Trustees voted to move forward with not one, but two potential properties. After much deliberation, we'll be sending letters of intent to purchase, letters of intent to purchase, to the seller of the corner building in the Bircher Complex, the one with the large green space, and to the seller of the warehouse. For those of you who aren't familiar with the warehouse, or for those of you who are familiar with the warehouse location, you will be pleased to know that the adjacent tenant, Terminix, will be moving out at some point. <laughs> Date TBD. Um, I wanted to reassure you that these letters are non-binding, meaning we can back out for any reason, and they aren't tying up any funds. 
The purpose of the letters is to start the due diligence and negotiation phases to determine and resolve issues with the property and arrive at a, at a purchase price. Our initial request will be for sellers to finance the mortgage, which we think will provide the most reasonable monthly payment, and that's been the concern all along. So that said, there are many, many unknowns and many, many issues to resolve, but we are now on our way. If you have any questions, you can ask me or any board member. Board members who are here, raise, raise your hands. Yeah. And um, if you have any questions, please seek them out after the service. And exciting times are ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you for all your efforts with this amazing project. At this, through our worship services, activities, and interest groups, we strive to live out our vision of being a transformational home for liberal spirituality and a dynamic community leader in Orange County and beyond. This morning, I'd like to invite my fiance's daughters, Alexandra and Chloe Horna, to like the chalice for us. They light the flaming chalice, the central symbol of our Unitarian Universalist heritage. The flame is a symbol of transcendence, truth triumphing over the forces of superstition and fear. Our circle proclaims that the earth and all its inhabitants are one. And from the common container of this chalice, we share the warm welcome of our beloved congregation. We pause this morning from the chaos of our worlds to reclaim the beauty in these walls, the beauty that carries us through the week. We lift this community onto our shoulders with pride and grace-filled expectation for our children and our children's children. Welcome to this time of community and this time of worship. Welcome back to Tapestry. When we come together and worship, we don't just reflect on ancient stories. We reflect on what happened last week or yesterday even. We have a couple of written joys to share with you. These were sort of floating around up front, so if I'm repeating anything, I apologize. One is from Dave Salahi that was celebrating the joy of Debbie's retirement. That's his wife. The other piece that I want to share with you is that at sundown today is the beginning of the new year for the Jewish community. It's Rosh Hashanah. So the Hebrew greeting is Shana Tova. So happy Rosh Hashanah for everyone. We also, on Sunday morning, silently light candles for those joys or sorrows that may be too tender or too private to be shared aloud. We hold those in our hearts as well as we read our congregational response. For your joys, we join you in celebration. For your sorrows and concerns, may you feel our compassion. And now we have a story for those young and young at heart of Caitlin, and you all want to join up here on the carpet. All right. Now, I realize I'm a season off, all right? It is, it is fall, but we are doing Under the Snow. I thought this would be such an easy topic to find a story for, and I went to the library three times. So if you have a suggestion for next year or for the next time we have this topic, I would love to hear it. But today we're going to see the wonder of life under the snow, which is pretty amazing. Ashlyn? Um, frogs actually hibernate. I know, there's a frog in here. And you know what? It freezes solid and then still lives in the spring, yeah. which I thought was amazing. I did not know that. Yeah. All right. In the heart of winter, a deep layer of snow blankets fields and forests, ponds, and wetlands. Not only am I a season off, but it's not really, it doesn't happen here either, but that's okay. <laughs> 
You spend your days sledding and skating and having snowball fights if you're lucky enough to be taken to the mountains. But under the snow lies a hidden world. And I didn't know many of these things. Under the snow in a field, dozens of ladybugs pack themselves into a gap in an old stone wall. Below them, a snake rests in a hole all its own. Voles spend their days tunneling through the snow. When they find a young tree, they slowly strip off layers of bark and eat them. Below the ground, a chipmunk snoozes for a few days at a time. Between naps, it snacks on the nuts and seeds stored in its burrow. Under the snow in a forest, a morning cloak butterfly takes cover in a pile of brush. Inside a rotting log, a centipede and a bumblebee queen remain silent and still until spring. A wood frog, here's the frog, nestles in scattered leaves on the forest floor. It can freeze solid and still survive. Not far away, a woolly bear caterpillar spends the winter curled up in a tight ball. Deal. Just below the ground, a spotted salamander waits for the coldest months of the year. Deeper down, a woodchuck sleeps soundly all winter long. Its heart rate drops and its breathing slows. The animal gets all the energy it needs from its thick layer of fat. I'm done. Okay, sweetie. Under the snow on a pond, bluegills circle slowly through the chilly water. They don't have enough energy to chase the water bottoms, the water boatman, excuse me, swimming nearby. A carp rests quietly at the muddy bottom. It is even, isn't even tempted by the water striders lying just a few inches away. Buried in the mud, a frog and a turtle wait out the winter. They never move, and they can barely breathe. Under the snow in a wetland, a beaver family huddles together inside a cozy log lodge. When they get hungry, they swim to their food storage pile and munch on some sticks. But even on the coldest winter days, red-spotted newts dodge and dart, whiz and whirl, just below the ice. As time passes, the sun's rays slowly grow stronger. Each day is a little bit longer. Animals living in fields and forests, ponds and wetlands begin to get ready for spring. And so do you, although we are getting ready for winter, although we don't have much to do. I'd, as I read this, I realize we don't get the... <laughs> The, the break that winter gives some communities, because it doesn't get cold and we don't get stuck inside, so we run around all winter. Um, we have lots of friends today, all right, and there's the flu shot clinic. The second to fifth graders are outside. There's a table out there. The youth group, there's a lot of you. If all of you plan to go to class, I did. We could, you can also go outside. So meet in the back, and we can decide. I pulled the chairs out. The preschool and first graders, you're in your regular classroom, all right? So everybody head to those directions. Who's, um... This morning's reading comes from Walt, Ralph Waldo Emerson and his essay, Nature. To speak truly, few adult persons can see nature. Most persons do not see the sun. At least they have a very superficial seeing. The sun illuminates only the eye of the man, but shines into the eye and the heart of the child. The lover of nature is he whose inward and outward senses are still truly adjusted to each other, who has retained the spirit of infancy even into the era of manhood. His intercourse with heaven and earth become part of his daily food. In the presence of nature, a wild delight runs through the man in spite of real sorrow. In the woods is perpetual youth. Within these plantations of God, a decorum and sanctity reign. A perennial festival is dressed, and the guest sees not how he should tire of them in a thousand years. In the woods, we return to reason and faith. There I feel that nothing can befall my life, no disgrace, no calamity, which nature cannot repair. Standing on the bare ground, my feet, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted in the infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. 
the currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or parcel of God. Namaste. Amen and blessed be. This past summer, during my sabbatical, I finally had the chance to visit the Grand Canyon. All these years I've been meaning to go, and it's actually relatively close to here in Southern California. And I was traveling that direction on a road trip, so it finally made sense to camp there. It was incredibly hot in July, and I was traveling with my dog, so we couldn't stay long or hike through the canyon, really. So we got up in the morning and went to look over the South Rim. And I like long adventures. I like camping and hiking. But it only took a very short time to get what I came for at the Grand Canyon. I got exactly what I was looking for. I got to be in the presence of something that was so big that it unhinged my sense of self. How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? I'm imagining a lot. Okay, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't think you could have possibly come up with a better name for it, because big certainly doesn't cut it. It's astoundingly, ridiculously huge. It's overwhelming from a human perspective. The scale is so large that it's outside of the scope of anything we experience in our normal lives. That's what's so amazing about it. 18 miles wide and a mile deep. A mile deep, that's twice as tall as the tallest man-made buildings. It is indeed grand. And there have been a lot of debates about how old it is, but apparently it's about six million years old. The overwhelming geography is carved by six million years of water persistently doing its thing. So in both of these factors, in time and in size, I can tell you these numbers, I could describe it, I could even put a picture up here. But supplying the information doesn't come anywhere near close to the experience of being there beside it. It's a truly awesome sight. That's why people go there year after year, to be in the presence of something awesome. A few weeks ago, one of our members said to me, I don't understand this word awesome. I didn't quite understand what she was talking about. My head jumped to Bart Simpson. But she explained, and it made a whole lot of sense. She explained that the word gets used for everything now. Of course, it emerged probably in the 80s as sort of a slang word. But now it's become more than common. It's become meaningless. If I have a good meal, that's awesome. If I get good parking, that's awesome. <laughs> and the example she gave that really brought it home was for parents who are potty training. If their child uses a toilet correctly, that's awesome. <laughs> and that is a very good thing. But is it really awesome? The standard definition for that word is causing or inducing awe, inspiring an overwhelming feeling of reverence, admiration, or fear. And I don't want to sound like a stick in the mud. I know that language adapts over time. It changes. It's not some static thing that's set forever and ever. And to be fair, Right under that, the third definition in the dictionary says it's slang for very impressive. And I love the example that they give. That new white convertible is totally awesome. <laughs> I think this shift in our vocabulary points to something more substantial than my stubborn use of the English language. It's not really about the word awesome. It's about our 
leveling out of the sacred and the mundane, our inability to discern what's neat from what's really life-changing. If we're lucky, if we prepare our hearts and seek them out, there are some truly awesome things in this world. I hope that we recognize them when they come our way. And I just hope that we aren't too distracted to recognize them when they come along. Those awesome experiences usually are a response to something in the outside world but they're really an emotional experience that we are having as a response. After all, it's about inspiring awe and wonder. It could be the Grand Canyon or the face of your beloved. It could also be something as small as a flower in an unexpected place. To have those aha moments, we don't just need the external stimulus. We also need to have an open heart, an open mind, to have that wonder. We need the emotional capacity to be deeply moved. Emotional capacity is a word that I'm half making up and half borrowing from psychology, but it seems to fit. What I mean by emotional capacity is our ability to be deeply moved to experience a full range of emotional response to the world around us. Now there are a few different attempts to define what those core emotions are. I kind of like this one because it poses them as opposites. Joy and sorrow, anger and fear, trust and distrust, surprise and anticipation. We have a tremendous ability as humans to feel this spectrum of very different things. And that innate natural ability is one of our most important gifts that we have. Unfortunately though, that innate gift of emotional capacity can get squelched by a few different things. One of the ways we limit it, if we're honest, is through drugs and alcohol. Alcohol has this numbing effect on our emotions. Not all of them, I, it, it, and it is all of them. <coughs> Not just the bad stuff, but everything. It dulls our emotions. It's sort of like seeing the world through a screen and drinking alcohol regularly, even in small amounts, impacts our emotional capacity. I'm not personally going to go home and pour out my liquor cabinet. I enjoy a glass of wine just like a lot of the people in this room. We don't necessarily have to stop drinking, but we should be aware that it makes a difference. It infringes on one of our most central human abilities. I'm not asking you to stop drinking. I'm just asking us to be honest and thoughtful about what we do. Another way our emotional capacity is shaped is through culture. Depending on our class or our gender or our race, we're told from a very early age which emotions are acceptable and which are not. We're told that some emotions in that spectrum are good and normal and that others are useless or even shameful. Our race, gender, and class weave together in a pretty complicated matrix with our personal history and our goals. And they unwittingly steer us towards some emotional responses and keep us away from others. Again, I'm not making any prescriptions about what we should change. It's just something to be aware of, something to be honest about. The last limit on emotional capacity that I want to talk about is the emotional habits that we create for ourselves. Just like any other habit, 
we gravitate toward doing the same things and feeling the same things over and over again. Allowing, even encouraging our heart to be moved in the same direction creates sort of a rut. And once we've worn that rut in one particular pathway, so clearly, so deeply, it becomes difficult to remember that there are other pathways that exist. In fact, after a while, the bushes grow over those other pathways. We forget that we can turn and go in a different direction. There are so many options. Joy and sadness and anger and fear, trust and distrust, surprise, anticipation. The best example that I can think of this habitual emotional experience is the obsession with engaging in news coverage. I try to read some of the paper every morning. I listen to a healthy dose of NPR. By no means do I suggest that we bury our heads in the sands. But for our emotional and spiritual well-being, we owe it to ourselves to differentiate what is new and helpful information from what is fodder for our emotional habits. When the primary purpose of news is to invoke fear, powerlessness, anger, and distrust, then we must turn it off and choose a different way of being in the world. The responsibility is ours. It's not CNN's. We have to take responsibility for our own emotional well-being. And this is only one example of an emotional rut that's impacting a lot of the people that I care about right now. But there are others. It's very, very easy to gravitate toward the same behavior that reinforces the same emotion. Just remember, you can always choose to do something else. Now, so far, this sounds more like an article from Psychology Today than a sermon. However, developing our emotional capacity is fundamental to our Unitarian faith. They used different language to describe it, but this is exactly what our transcendentalist forebearers were talking about. You've probably heard of transcendentalism as a literary movement. Walt Whitman, Margaret Fuller, Emily Dickinson, Henry David Thoreau, and of course, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Even if you haven't read them, you're familiar with their names. They were a group of friends, and they were a overwhelming intellectual powerhouse in America. Beyond being brilliant people, they were also writing at a really important time in American history. They were creating sort of a new intellectual American canon in the early 1800s, just as American culture was solidifying and gelling. This was also the time that Unitarianism was really differentiating itself from Protestant Christianity. We were gelling too. And all of these brilliant writers, these transcendentalists, were Unitarians. And their philosophy still today rests at the foundation of our Unitarian theology. These transcendentalists believed deeply in the profound richness of this world, both in beauty and in strife. They believed that reaching out to personally experience that richness was the fundamental key to our connection with what is sacred. For Emerson and his peers, the only way to experience the divine was to reach out and experience the world for yourself. It's up to you. You have to reach out, you have to open yourself to the bounty of spirit and beauty that surrounds you. This is actually why Emerson left his ministry. Because he thought real religion 
isn't to be found in theology books or even in church. Real, worthwhile religion is a personal encounter with something awesome. So I guess the question is, where or how are you going to seek out that direct experience of transcending mystery and wonder? For me, I find inspiration most easily and most often in nature. I had a great fortune of growing up in a family that did that as well. I find God in the mountains, at the ocean, even occasionally in a single beautiful flower. I also find the holy when I witness compassion and acts, when I see regular old people compelled by something to give deeply of themselves. Witnessing that compassion stirs my soul. And in a similar but different way, I'm stirred by the healing and wholeness that comes as marginalized communities struggle for justice together, as they struggle for their own dignity. I experience the holy listening to a beautiful music, particularly a human voice. In seminary, and sometimes still today, when I read really good theology, a really clear description of what I have felt, that stirs me too. I found comfort and confirmation that there's a there there. No matter how much I describe these things for myself, though, I can't give them to you. So I leave you today with the question, where have you found the sacred in your life? When is your soul stirred? When does the sun shine not just in your eyes, but into your heart? And after you leave here today, where will you go and find that invigorating, awesome source of life again? Where will you go? Who will you talk to? What will you read or listen to or eat? How will you put yourself in the presence of the holy? And will your heart be ready to respond when you get there? Amen. We extinguish this flame knowing the light remains and the warmth and compassion of our hearts until we are together again. Would you take the hand of someone near you for just a moment for these closing words? And a reminder, if you would step outside um, following the service while we set up for the potluck, it would be much appreciated. And if you're looking for a little extra workout, we could use the help. Worship need not cease. It can echo in our lives, in our words, in our deeds, in our moods, in our dreams. Carry worship with you wherever you go. Now go in peace and let the light within you be a blessing to the world.